the last part of Second Corinthians ten five, which I'm throwing out there all the time because it is so, so very important, says, take captive every thought, submitting it to the obedience of Christ. Now, in this, this painting I'm doing, there's lots of random brush strokes on here and random colors, and it's looking abstract and kind of, okay, where in the world are you going with this? Well, if you think about the subconscious and all of the thoughts that go through your head, and I'm not even going to try and remember how many thoughts, it's like 80,000 a day. If all of those brush strokes are the thoughts that come from the subconscious and they're just random flying out of everywhere, those are the thoughts that they come up and we take them captive and we submit them to Christ, making them obedient to Him. We need to recognize and we get to recognize those thoughts can be captured. They can be held on. And we do look at them. We have the ability to take that thought and go, where did that thought come from? Is it me from the enemy? Is it because I watched a movie and I thought this was a good idea? And oh my goodness, it's not. So we have all of these varying factors that impact how we think, what we think, what we say, our behavior. And taking them captive, it it takes practice. It doesn't just, oh, here, let me do it. Well, as I'm putting all these random brush strokes and colors down, I'm not necessarily taking them captive yet, but I'm paying attention to them. I'm paying attention to what's going on visually. This is a visual representation of that. Um, so it's kind of like all of it coming out here and what am I going to do with it? Let's look at the idea or the fact that your brain that amazing organ thing between your ears is pretty busy all the time and when i say that i mean that your brain needs 20 percent of your body's calories just to function that's more than any other organ in your body and that's just to maintain and function everyday thought process. That's not intense studying or trying to think through a problem or trying to work through a difficult conversation with someone and think about what to say. That means that your brain is 20%, 20% of what your calories, the stuff that makes you have energy and work, 20% of that goes to your brain right off the the bat. And we also know that your brain needs a lot of water, like a ton of water. But do you realize that your brain is the smaller? It's only 2% of your body weight. It's not very big. And yet it takes more energy, more calories to make and allow your brain to function than it does any other organ in your body. Did you also know that thinking the thoughts that you have where they come from what you're doing this continual process of thinking is active it's not passive I know we think oh I'm going to sit and think and someone sitting and thinking looks like they're not doing anything they're not expending any energy that is a lot of energy that's being extend expended because your brain is I don't, I'm not going to say hyperactive. I'm saying it's very active all the time. Even when you're sleeping, you have your conscious and your subconscious. And when you're sleeping, your subconscious is taking over and your brain is kind of calming down, but it's still working, thinking, going through processes. You've got different levels of sleep that you go through that the brain is, um, that the brain participates in, obviously, because it's your brain that's asleep. So, when, when we talk about the brain and thinking and thoughts, this is a full-on, like, marathon, triathlon, massive, constant, all the time, energy-expending exercise. And then you wonder why, well, I didn't do anything today. I just studied or I just dealt with this highly difficult emotional situation. And why am I so tired? That's because your brain has and uses more energy than any other part of your body because 
you are so active with your thought processes. Okay, one more nerdy brain thing. When you are doing something and when you're thinking about doing something, your brain does not know the difference. If you're doing it, your brain's like, yes, we're doing this. If you're not doing it, but you're thinking about doing it, your brain is going, yes, we're doing this. Clearly, if your body's not moving, you're not doing it, but your brain thinks you're doing it because you're thinking about it. This is one of those things I call muscle memory also. And it's very interesting when you look at this, when you think about, okay, where do my thoughts come from? Why is my brain constantly moving and thinking? And then why does my brain think if I'm thinking about something, I'm actually doing it? It is one of these amazing creative things God has given us um, that we're created in his image, which means he does that also. Now, how cool is that? Okay, oops, I have one more brain thing. Your brain, your thoughts, blah, blah, blah. Like, like we said, you have your conscious and your subconscious. And 90% of your behavior comes from your subconscious. 90% of your thoughts come from your subconscious, not your conscience. That's a hard conscience. Conscience. Is that better? I cannot. Okay, just just say it right in your head when I'm saying it probably wrong. The point is, the subconscious mind brain is what actually you respond to life from to through all of those good things. And if it's subconscious, how do you know that's where your thoughts where your behaviors are coming from? When you do something, and you're like, why in the world did I just do that, say that whatever, because it seems out of character for you, or you're thinking, Oh, my goodness, I said that, and I can't get it back. That's because it comes from the subconscious. Now, the amazing thing about this is as a believer, you've been given the mind of Christ, when you have the mind of Christ, it doesn't change your subconscious, subconscious, I still can't say that word. What happens is having the mind of Christ begins to show you how Christ thinks, how God wants you to behave, and how you respond to him, which overflows into how you respond to everyone else. And it's interesting that it doesn't necessarily say, it. well, it doesn't say you have the brain of Christ, it says you have the mind of Christ. Wow, okay, well, it'd be hard to have the brain of Christ because, well, we know all of that story. Um, resurrection, the whole cool thing, but we have the mind of Christ. So what does all of this mean? Okay, let's put the brain stuff and the scripture stuff together. Going back to 2 Corinthians 10, 5, that last portion, um, if we submit something to Christ, if we capture the thought and we submit it to Christ, um, this is what happens. In the brain, when you think about something or you think about something and then you decide you're not going to think about it anymore, you're going to remove it, it's kind of like if you remove sugar from your diet, the neuroreceptors in the brain start freaking out. And I want sugar, I want sugar. And the last thing you want to do is think about sugar. And that's all you can do is think about sugar because you said I'm no longer eating sugar. So that immediately makes the brain go, but, but, but we like sugar. So that's when your urges and cravings for sugar 
um, really kick in. It's the same thing with these thoughts. Well, I'm not going to think about this. So if I tell you to not think about a pink elephant, I guarantee you a pink elephant just popped up in your brain. This is how God created us. So if we're taking thoughts and capturing them and asking them, making them submit to the obedience of Christ, we're taking that thought and we're saying, is this truth or is this a lie? If it's a lie, you get rid of it and you replace it with the truth. Where do we find the truth? We find the truth in scripture. That is the only truth. And yes, I'm laying it down. Scripture is the only truth. Yes, we have science. Yes, we have facts. Yes, God has put the earth in, you know, orbit and the planets and all the things. And yet when it comes down to it, everything was created by God and God is truth. So anytime we have science and we have all of these cool things, if it lines up with truth, then it is true. If it does not, then it is not true. Okay, getting off topic here. The point is, when we submit something to God, to Christ, we're saying, is this true? Is this who you think I am? Is this, okay, God, is this what you say about me? Is this who you think I am? Is this the truth? And if it's not the truth, then we get rid of it. Or we take the sword and we annihilate it. But that means we replace it with the truth. Because if you just get rid of something, it leaves a vacancy. It leaves a void. You need to fill the void with something. And we fill the void with truth. When you finally grab that thought, you wrestle it down, you really look at it, and you're trying to figure out if it's true or not, Philippians 4, 8 is a fabulous place to start with a very simple formula, I guess I could say. Philippians 4, 8 in the NIV says, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Okay, the message has another, of course, it's the message, it's a translation. Um, I mean, it's a paraphrase, but I really like what it says. Summing it all up, friends, I'd say you'll do best by filling your minds and meditating on things true, noble, reputable, authentic, compelling, gracious, the best, not the worst, the beautiful, not the ugly, things to praise, not things to curse. Okay, when you're taking that thought captive, you're looking at it, you're wrestling it to the ground saying, I am going to figure out if you are true or not. The very first thing in Philippians 4, 8 is whatever is true. This is where we go. We start right there. We find the truth. That's the first bit of this little I kind of want to call it a formula, but it's find the truth. And the truth is always, what does God think of me? Who does God say I am? How does God feel about me? Am I important to God? And then you go from there and find the rest of the things. It's kind of like this really cool, uh, like a rabbit trail, maybe. Kind of fun, kind of interesting to go through. So as you're thinking about this, what I've done is removed everything on this painting except what I want to expose and show as the truth. And again, this is just a visual representation, but it's one of those ways that I really like getting my head wrapped around something, looking at something, figuring out what's true, figuring out what's not true, what's worthy of respect, you know, what's pure. It's just a visual representation, but as I'm doing it, I can think about all of this other stuff. I'm removing it. I'm blacking it out. I'm putting it out of my mind because it's not true. And I'm going to hold on to the things that are true, which, again, in the message, it says, think on things that are beautiful and not ugly, things to praise, not things to curse. Mm -hmm.